Morning, guys. I love that guy. Thank you for being a part of our service today. I am honored to be here. I was going to say go Seahawks. <laughs> a little too soon. Just a little too soon, yeah. But I am honored that you're here with us. We're starting a brand new series today called This Is The Way. And yeah, I know that's a phrase out of The Mandalorian. No, I will not be showing Mandalorian clips, probably. You never quite know. It's possible. But uh, actually, Christianity, the, the, the Christians were called people of the way. Early on, that was how we were known as, as, as Christ followers, as people of the way. So we're going to talk about, in the weeks to come, um, what it means to practice the way, what it means to look like that. And we're going to land on prayer, the Lord's Prayer. And how to approach God today will be in Matthew chapter 6. You've got your Bible or your Bible app open up to Matthew the 6th chapter if you're new. We do um, provide the outline on version. If you want to download that, follow along. You can follow, that, follow along and take notes even on the version Bible app, which uh, you'll find uh, all the stuff we're doing today right there. You know, before the holiday season, we actually did an extended series on the kingdom of God. In fact, most of October, November, we talked about the kingdom. Why? Well, the simple answer is because Jesus taught a lot about the kingdom of God. So we want to be like him, follow him, do what he did. And Jesus taught a great deal. In fact, it was not just some minor part of his teaching. He emphasized it from the beginning of his, his ministry and over and over again. In fact, Jesus said this in Luke 4, 43. It was the centerpiece of his teaching. He said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. Jesus said, here's the big deal. I was sent to preach the good news of the kingdom of God. Now the kingdom is mentioned like 157 times in the New Testament, 98 times in the Gospels alone. Jesus referred to it like 80 times. And 15 of the 34 parables have to do with the kingdom of God. Almost half have to do with the kingdom. So that's why we took weeks and walked through this, because it was important for you to understand. If you missed that, or if you don't listen to everything I always say, yeah, let me give you a little bit of a review um, of what the kingdom is. The kingdom of God is not just a realm or a place. It's not just heaven and a sweet by and by. The kingdom of God is the rule and reign of God. The rule and reign of God in our lives and through our lives. In fact, I love this definition by George Ladd, who's a theologian who passed away many years ago. But he wrote a book on the kingdom. And his definition, it is the definition is, it is the dynamic intervention and manifestation of the power and authority of God in and through our lives that leads to transformation. It's a mouthful. Let me say it again. What is the kingdom of God? It is the dynamic intervention. It's not static. It's not dead. It's active and it's living. It's dynamic intervention. God is intersecting with our lives and manifesting, showing himself, proving himself, his power and his authority in us and through us. That's the kingdom. In us and through us, bringing transformation to our lives and to the world around us. Throughout 2021, the rest of this year, we're going to cycle back to kingdom practices. If we're talking about the kingdom of God. We're going to talk about kingdom practices. And we won't be in this in the entire year. We'll take a break from time to time. Uh, but I want you to understand the kingdom practices matter because the kingdom of God matters. We're talking about things like solitude, rest, forgiveness, worship, service, community, and prayer, which is what we're going to land on today. Now, when a pastor says prayer or talks about praying, one of two extremes often takes place. Either immediate boredom response or fearful response. He's like, ah, you know what, prayer doesn't really excite me that much, or been there, done that, or I know everything I know, I need to know about prayer, or uh, let's not expect anything from me because pr pr prayer actually freaks me out just a little bit. I am very aware of how praying in public makes people nervous. If I grab the mic that Ryder had, and I started walking around the auditorium, said, I'm looking for someone that would pray for us this morning. I bet most of you would become very familiar with the coffee stain near you. You'd start staring down at the carpet. You wouldn't want to make eye contact with me. Why? Because a lot of us are nervous when it comes to praying in public. I get it. I'm aware of that, and I understand it. When I was 19 in Bible college, uh, one of my professors in class, quite to my surprise, said to me, hey, Kurt, would you open our class today in prayer? And I grew up in church. I've been praying and been around prayers thousands of times. And when he asked me to pray, it's like I just went, oh, and just froze, and my mouth went dry, and everything started sweating, and I, my, you know, I went brain dead and couldn't think of what I was going to say. And I'm sure it was only like 10 or 15 seconds, but it felt like an eternity went by before I finally, you know, said something religious, I'm sure, not very good, and then gave a weak amen. And it was terrifying. I get it. I understand. I can tell you other stories. 
For a lot of people, praying in public is hard because they equate prayer with public speaking. It's still like in the top three things people are afraid of is talking in public. So that's part of our challenge is we have a perspective issue. We look at it sort of as praying in public and it's not that it's talking to God. Another huge struggle we have is that we, I mentioned, is that we just have a perspective issue. We think it's something we must do in a particular way. We've got to do it the right way, use the right words. And if we don't, then we're messing it up. We're blowing it up. We've got a lot of performance-based stuff still in our relationship with God. And if you know me, you know that I'm not into performance-based love. I don't think that's healthy. And it's certainly not the way it should be in our relationship with God. But a lot of us, we just think, well, if I don't do it the right way, then it's, well, it's, it's not okay. So many of us struggle with public prayer. We also struggle, though, with private prayer. We struggle. I get it. I know. I think, man, I, the longest prayer I think I've ever prayed on my own was like 30 seconds. I really didn't know what to say. And, well, you know, I didn't, I didn't, how do I talk to God? And, and I get it. I do understand. So what we're going to do is we're going to unpack what is commonly referred to as the Lord's Prayer. We're going to start at it today, and we're going to take some weeks to take, unpack it and take a look at it. And my intent is because I want you to understand more about what prayer is and isn't. With that in mind, let's pick it up. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 to 13. Matthew 6. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now it is a beautiful prayer. In Luke's version of this, Luke chapter 11, we find that Jesus taught them this prayer because they asked him, Lord, teach us how to pray. The disciples must have heard Jesus many times pray. Now, they grew up. They were church kids, too, just like I was. Uh, synagogue kids. kids. They, they grew up, and they'd heard lots of rabbis. They'd heard lots of people pray. But there was something they recognized in the way Jesus did this, in the way Jesus prayed, that was not the religious formal prayers of the rabbis that they'd grown up around. It was something very different that they saw and they heard in him. Part of my personal struggle, I mentioned this, is that I grew up in church, and there's nothing bad with that. But I was taught that prayers were something you say. That's got, indirectly or directly, that's sort of what I was taught. Prayer is something you say. And the truth is, uh, it, we, we memorize prayers are not evil, but that's not what we, we don't say prayer. We talk with God. It's not some memorized speech, and it's certainly not about a method. It's about a model, which takes me to point number one in your outline. A model for approaching God. Number one, Jesus gave us a model for prayer, not a mandate or a method. Jesus gave us a model. That's what the Lord's Prayer is all about. It's a model for prayer, not a mandate or a method. When the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray, they, they said, teach us how to pray. They didn't say, teach us what to pray. They said, teach us how to pray. And the difference between what and how is really important. And you need to understand that Jesus gave them a model. While I was uh, thinking about this uh, talk and trying to define what the importance of a model and learning how to do something versus exactly um, what to say, I was thinking about if you were in med school, now I've never been in med school, but if you're in med school and you go through these lectures and they teach you how to do, let's say a surgery, an ap appendectomy, appendectomy, yeah, a surgery. <laughs> I'm having a hard time talking this morning. It must be the effect that I was, ah, never mind. Um, so they, they're teaching people how to do surgery and they tell them, well, you cut here and you look for the ucky stuff and then you pull out the, the bad stuff. That's my highly technical way to describe a surgery. But if I'm going to go to a hospital, I don't want a doctor that just was told what to do or, or read about what to do. I want a guy that's actually had some practice and he's watched people do it. That's why they have internships. So they, they practice on cadavers probably and then they get to watch other doctors do it. Because you want to see how to do that, just not just be told what to do. When we talk about the Lord's Prayer, it is a beautiful prayer. I love it. But it was never meant to be a canned or memorized speech. It was a model for us. Now, if you've used it as a prayer, grew up in church where it was used all the time, that, again, nothing evil about that. But you need to know that Jesus' intent here was not just to say, okay, memorize this. When they said, teach us how to pray, Jesus said, okay, get this, memorize it, make sure you get it right. Oh, make sure you use King James English too, though Jesus didn't use that. And, and then you're good to go. That's not this point at all. Prayer is not about a method or liturgy or a technique or a system. It's a, Jesus gave us a model about how to approach God and how to pray. The Lord's Prayer, the reason why I love it so much. 
is that it reveals the focus of our prayers. Our Father, who art in heaven. It reveals uh, that we're to honor God. Hallowed, holy be your name. It discloses that we ought to be uh, seeking his kingdom. It says, your kingdom come, your will be done. What's the desire of our heart? God, I want more of you. It recognizes our dependence. There's so much of that in this prayer. Our dependence on God. Give us our daily bread. Forgive us. Lead us. Deliver us. So the Lord's Prayer, as, which is what we call it. Jesus didn't call it that. But it reveals and encourages. It discloses and it recognizes so much. And it is, again, an amazing prayer. But we need to understand that it was a model because God is near. And he wants to have a conversation with us. Jesus taught them to come without fanfare, without religious display or formality, but he showed them how to come and to make it real and relational, which takes me to point number two. Prayer is a personal conversation with the real and living God. This is the part that I really want you to hear today. Prayer is about a conversation with a real and living God. Jesus prayed in verse 9, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He prayed to the Father. Papa God, our Father, God in heaven. See, everything about this prayer, you may not have recognized this before, but everything about it is personal and relational. Jesus was not talking at God. He wasn't talking about God. He was talking to his Father. It was personal, and it was very real. And that's an important part of coming to the Father that we need to remember, is he wants us to keep it real and to keep it conversational. I was at a wedding uh, summer before last, and I was just uh, uh, there watching the ceremony. And the young guy that did the ceremony, I, I think probably is his 20-something, was doing fine. And he got down, worked through the whole thing, and which was did, did a great job. And then he, and they said, well, let, let us pray. And he, he was normal up until that moment. Because then he went into this, our Father and our God, 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 God. And I'm like, what is going on? I said, suddenly he started talking weird and, and, and a different voice and, and using King James English. And I'm thinking, this is not the point here. Can you imagine how weird it would be if you talked to your spouse that way? Our wife, Laura, Laura, Laura. <laughs> no, that's just not okay. It's not conversational. And that's what I love about the Lord's Prayer. Jesus started with our Father. He said, Father in heaven. It was real. It was relational. It was a conversation with God. So to be clear, I'm not suggesting we just flippantly or, or casually, disrespectfully come to God. When I say we want to keep it real and conversational, I, I'm not encouraging to say, yo God, hey big guy up in the sky. You know, that's not, what, that's not the way you want to approach him either. When the Bible talks about having fear of the Lord, a lot of people misunderstand that. That it means being terrified of God, terrified of his anger or his wrath. What it really means is that we come with a reverence, with an awe. When you realize who you're talking to, Almighty God created the universe and who he is, it ought to bring into your presence, into your prayer, something that's fairly serious. You're not going to just flippantly come to him. Jesus said in verse 9, this is how you pray. Hallowed be your name. Holy is your name. He's saying, Father, may you and your name always be kept holy in our hearts and on our lips. But God does want you to come conversationally to him and to relate to him, to keep it relational and to talk to him, not at him. I've heard parents say to you know, their kids at night, you know, we're over visiting or having dinner with some friends or something, and their kids are little. They say, hey, did you say your prayers? Yes, mommy, I said my prayers. Now, when that happens, if it's ever happened in your home and I'm there, again, I don't think, oh, man, those people are idiots. I'm not, that's not, and there's nothing evil about that. The intent is not bad. But I grew up that way, being pretty much taught that prayer is something you say. You say to God. You know, rub-a-dub-dub, three men in a tub, whatever. God, thanks for the grub. I mean, we come with these sad, these preformed prayers, and we believe that's the way we're to approach him, and that's not it at all. We want to have a conversation with God all of their life. We had four kids, and every night, one of us at least, would make it a pattern to go in. The last thing we would do is pray with our kids. And they'd be in their beds, all tucked away, and we'd just say, hey, let's pray. Let's talk to Jesus. And we never said, have you said your prayers? We said, let's talk to Jesus. Let's talk to God. Let's talk to Father God. And sometimes, and I, I, I remember these moments because they were just so precious to me. Daddy, I don't know what to say. And, and I would say, that's okay. 
Sometimes I don't know what to say either. Just tell God how you feel. Well, I feel really sad right now. Good. Tell God that you feel really sad. Oh, I'm, I'm really happy today, Dad. I got to play with frogs all day. It was awesome. Tell God you're happy because you got to play with frogs. Just express your heart to him. Have a conversation with God. We try to teach our kids that because prayer should be conversational. When it's conversational, when you approach it that way, there's a few things that will happen. To begin with is that you'll become aware of his presence. When you're not talking at something or someone, but having a conversation with someone, then you become aware that God is here. The God of the universe. I'm having a conversation with someone. And that awareness brings clarity. Have you ever noticed that one of the best things about prayer is that the world can be going to pieces, everything can be falling apart, but when you stop and you just take a time out and you invest a little bit of time with God, it brings perspective. I'm realizing now, okay, God is here and I can bring my pain, my struggles, my sorrows, my joys, I bring it all to Him. And so you become aware that the Father is not only present, but it gives clarity, a different perspective to what's going on in your life. And that awareness and that clarity brings comfort and peace. That awareness that God is there and God is listening to you brings comfort to your soul in a way that nothing else can. Prayer is a personal conversation with God. It's real. It's something you're, you're conversing with a living God who wants to, to hear from you, who wants you to bring all your stuff, all the good, bad, everything. He wants you to bring it all to him. Your pain, your cares, your worries. God wants you to bring that to him and be honest, be real. And as you do, you'll experience God's peace in a way that exceeds your ability to comprehend. It just does. It will exceed your ability to figure out. Your circumstances may not change at all, but you will. Many times. I can't tell you how many times, but I could safely say probably hundreds in my life. I hit that 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock hour, and I wake up, and the older I get, it's to do my business. But yeah, I wake up 2 or 3 in the morning, and I go back to bed, and I'm trying to sleep. And I start thinking. My brain starts going. And then I start worrying. And then, you know what the worry monster is? That thing that jumps on your chest in the middle of the night? Poof, 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 that worry monster just starts landing on me. And, and there, I have learned this lesson. Here's a little, here's a little practical encouragement to you. You can lay in bed tossing and turning for an hour trying to figure out what you're going to do the next day or do the smart thing. Just get up and go to the living room and walk around and talk to Jesus. It works. Trust me. It works. It's so much better to cast those cares on him. I can't tell you how many times I get up in the middle of the night and I just start, I, I walk and pray uh, because it's one way for me to make sure I'm staying awake. And, you know, if I knelt before the couch, I would probably fall into a pool of drool before too long. So I, I walk and I pray and I talk to God. And the more I express my concerns, the more I bring those worries to him, the more I say, God, this is what's going on in my life, the more I'm aware that he's with me, his presence is there. It may not change anything about my circumstances that, at that moment. It's not as if I get a call at three in the morning. Hey, by the way, good news. That thing you're worried about is all taken care of. Nope. But here's what does happen. I change. Perspective, prayer, conversation with God changes me in a way that gives me the peace I need. And when you pray, by the way, here's another thing I want you to remember, is that prayer is not found in the eloquence of your words. You know, we read the Lord's Prayer, and we think, oh, that's just so beautiful. It's just such, a, such a wonderful turn of phrase, and Jesus did such a good job. Prayer is not in the eloquence of your words. It's not found in your ability to memorize, repeat something. Prayer is found in experience it best as you invest time in conversation. Conversation with the one who is near, with the one who longs to be with you, who wants to be with you, who cares about you more than you can possibly imagine. What if you mess up? People are like, well, I don't know. You know, I just, what if I blow it? What if I do it wrong? And I tell people, no, there's only, here's point number three in your outline. There's only really one mistake you can make. And that's when it comes to prayer, that's not praying. There's only one mistake you can make when it comes to prayer, and that's not praying. You can't blow this. You can't make this up. You can't fail here if you just come to God. Just pray. Just come to him. Say, well, I don't know what to say. Just tell him how you feel. Tell him what's going on in your heart and your life. But here's what I know. Some people don't pray because they don't realize how powerful it is. If you had any idea how truly powerful prayer is in your life and can be in your life, I think you spend a lot more time, invest a lot more time on your face in prayer. 
Because you realize, wait a minute, I'm talking to God Almighty, God of the universe, the creator God, the God who knows all, the sovereign God. And if you understand that power, when you tap into that, you're going to want to spend, I keep saying spend, really, I should say invest more time in prayer when you realize how powerful it is. Some people say, well, I'm just too busy to pray. I would suggest it means you're way too busy. But here's what I've experienced. The busier I get, the more I need to pray, not less. The busier I get, busyness tends to spin me out, tends to mess me up, tends to send me down to a dark hole and into the, to a place that's not healthy, not holy. So the busier I get, the more I realize, man, I need to spend more time with God in prayer, not less. Some people don't pray because they think they're just not worthy. A woman told me once, and she was dead serious when she said this. She said, I, I don't think God really wants to hear from me. I said, what? Who told you that? She said, well, I just, I'm a screw up. I'm an embarrassment to my family and my friends. And I'm sure I'm an embarrassment to God. I, don't, I just don't think he wants to hear from me. And I said, no, dear, dear, dear person, let me tell you the truth. God loves to hear from screw ups. Hello. He does. He loves it when we come humble of heart and we just get on our face and we say, God, oh God, oh God, I need you. Here I am again. I can't tell you how many times that prayer's been on my lips. Here I am again. <laughs> if you knew how many times I prayed that prayer, you'd probably be a little nervous. <laughs> God, I just, uh, God, here I am again. I thought that thing again, said that thing again, did that thing again. Here I am again, God. And never, not one time has God said, oh, for heaven's sakes. <laughs> For my sakes, I just can't believe you. No, <laughs> never. It's always, hey, I'm so glad you're here with me. Don't be afraid of doing it wrong. Don't be afraid of not getting it right. What matters most is not what you say, but the heart that, that you say it with. What matters most is not the right words, but that you, that you come to the Father and that you... Don't discount yourself. Don't, don't write yourself off because you think you're not worthy because you've sinned too much. Don't think, well, I'm not capable of talking to God. Just reach out and talk to him. Reach out and talk to the Father who loves you beyond measure and have a conversation with him. One of my favorite books back in the uh, 70s actually was published. Its first edition was published, I think, 1968. It's a book called Prayer, Conversing with God by a woman named Rosalind Rinker, R-I-N-K-E-R. -E I think it's in its third or fourth publication now. And it's a small little book, and I read it uh, years and years ago, and it radically revolutionized my perspective of prayer because she talked about prayer just being a conversation with God. That it's a conversation between two people who love each other. That's the way I want you to see prayer. It's a conversation between two people who love each other. And if you think, well, yeah, but I just don't know if I can say it right or do it right. Well, with that in mind, let's watch this together. I love it. Especially the end. <laughs> Do you know how many times I felt just like that little kid coming to God? God, I don't know what to say. And I blubber through some things in incoherent prayer and, and the whole time. If you're a dad or mom or grandparent especially, and your little kid comes up to you, your nephew, your whatever comes up to you and does that, what do you say? Well, for heaven's sake, what are you going to figure out how to talk? 
I have nothing to say. I don't want to hear it until you can get clear that up and make sure you, you need to work on your communication skills. <laughs> <laughs> or you go, oh, that's just the, and you want to get down, just squeeze that little guy, it's to, you know, with all your heart. That's the way our Father is. Listen to me. If you feared prayer, if you thought, if you've been afraid of coming to God in prayer, if you, if you thought, oh, I just don't, can't do it right, I don't know what to say, just come to God. That's all he cares about is just come to him. So many times in my life, so many times, I felt just like that. Lord, I don't know what to say, but it's not about the right words. Jesus gave us a model. He gave us a relational model, a conversational model. It's real, it's personal. And he understands our struggle. He gets that this is not something we're all comfortable with, but he wants you to grow. With that in mind, I'm going to ask you to stand with me. Our closing prayer today is not going to be me praying something, but it's going to be us praying something together. And I want us to pray out loud and pray with some passion the Lord's Prayer. Now, some of you grew up in church and you've said the Lord's Prayer in public, uh, you know, worship many, many times together. And I get that. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If this is your first time or the tenth time or the hundredth time that you've done this in church, I'm going to ask you to do this. Pray this as a conversational prayer from your heart to God. Don't just walk through the words. Seriously, literally, passionately say, God, this is my heartfelt prayer to you. Let's pray this together. Ready? Begin. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That prayer, a model, real, relational, simple, powerful. That's what Jesus wants. And that's what the Father wants for us, to just come to worship Him, to pray to Him, to talk to Him, to open our hearts to Him and to say, God, here I am again. I want to finish with that song that we learned this morning, that one about how God is so holy. Let's sing that with all our hearts. I'll come back and wrap it up.